Welcome, everyone, and welcome, gentlemen. Uh, in the early 1880s, Nietzsche wrote of a madman who, while wielding a lantern in the bright morning, declared that God had died. He exclaimed to a group of educated and enlightened atheist onlookers that we had, in fact, killed God. He went on, but how did we do this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained this earth from its sun? Where is it moving now? Where are we moving to? Away from all suns? Are we not continually falling and backwards, sidewards, forwards in all directions? Is there still an up and a, and a down? Of course, the madman's audience did not really understand what he was saying. He noted then that though we had killed God, we had not yet experienced the effects that this death would have on the world. The madman then proceeded to force his way into nearby churches, singing, singing a requiem for God, declaring churches to be nothing more than tombs of God. Now, Nietzsche did not think highly of Christianity, but he recognized not merely that we were starting to lose belief in God, but that God had bled to death under our knives, that we had been slowly and surely undermining our ability to believe in God. And he knew that the loss of God, specifically the God of Christianity, would result in a seismic shift in the world. Now, this is what we'll be discussing this evening. First, what brought us to this culture, which is quickly and perhaps already become post-Christian? And second, what should we, the church, do or become in response to this change? I'd like to start with you, Mr. Dreer, uh, and just tell us a little bit about what you think has brought us, the American culture or Western culture in general, to the place where we can call it post-Christian. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. This is something I think about a lot, and I have to be careful not, not to get too involved in the answer because you can go back. A, a lot of people like to go back to the, um, the, the end of the Middle Ages and the, the defeat of scholasticism by nominalism, but uh, I, I think we can be a little more contemporary than that. Um, I, uh, there are three thinkers that tell me where we are today that help me get a bead of where we are and why we're there. Uh, Philip Reef is someone I, I've been really influenced by. He, was, he died in 2008. He was a secular Jewish uh, cultural critic. Um, he wrote a biography of Freud. But the book that I think was his most important was called The Triumph of the Therapeutic. It came out in 1966. And in this book, I mean, if you read it now, it, it, it's incredible because Reef saw everything coming. In fact, he said it was already here, but most of us didn't know it. Briefly, he, he had a theory of culture in which he said every culture has to d define itself by what it is against. It has to have some thou shalt nots. Well, ours is the first culture that defines itself by forbidding thou shalt nots that seeks to, over, to, to throw everything out, to throw all the prohibitions out. He said, ours is a culture that cannot, be, cannot do what a culture is supposed to do, which is form people and hold them together. He said that ours was a therapeutic culture. What he meant by that was things had changed in our civilization, and we had gone from uh, a time of Christianity and, and the uh, Abrahamic religion uh, when we sought truth, we instead decided that, that that can't be found, and instead we wanted to find something, some solution to help us live well, uh, to deal with our anxieties and our suffering. And what was true then was what made it easy for us to, to get along in life and to be happy. Uh, happiness, not truth, was a goal in life. Well, Reef said that by the mid-60s, this had already was deeply, deeply embedded in the American way of life, and the churches were ignoring it. The churches did not know what was going to come on them. Well, everything that Reef said in that book was going to happen has happened now. Um, but I, I, I think that the, his teaching that we would become the sort of people who thought the way to freedom is to throw off all encumbrances, everything, all traditions, everything that, that kept us from being who we wanted to be. He said, that's where we were going, and indeed, we are there. He said religion was going to become that too, a therapeutic kind of religion. There's another thinker, uh, he died a couple of years ago, Zygmunt Bauman. He was a, uh, a Jewish sociologist and a Marxist. 
uh, he had this theory of what he called liquid modernity. And Bellman said that when, at the, at the dawn of the modern period, things began to radically shift, like around the time of the Enlightenment and Industrial Revolution. Um, old ways of life and old ways of thinking began to change under the, um, the, after the French Revolution, with the Industrial Revolution and so forth. Uh, they changed very quickly, but they still changed slowly enough to where people could get used to them. And, uh, but as things moved on, as uh, we became wealthier, as we became uh, more technologically dependent, uh, modernity mo started changing faster and faster until finally it became liquid. What he meant by liquid was before any of the new forms were able to solidify, they changed again. And Bauman said that in a state of liquid modernity, which we're living in now, the person who succeeds is the one who has the fewest commitments. Uh, he said man has gone in the West from being a pilgrim, which is to say uh, someone on a, a religious journey, on a, on a journey that has a, a direction, a certain direction towards a religious end, and that we're going on together. He's gone from being a pilgrim to being a tourist. And a tourist is someone who you know, goes wherever he wants to as his will, um, as his will dictates and he has no direction in life. This is the sort of person, by the way, that St. Benedict called the worst kind of monk, the gyrovague, who just goes, flits from here to there, has no roots anywhere, and uh, there's no weight to his life. Well, Bauman says that's what we're living in now. And uh, so there's Reeve talking about the therapeutic, and there's Zygmunt Bauman saying that we are cease to be pilgrims and have become tourists. Finally, uh, for me, the thinker, the contemporary thinker who is most helpful in helping me understand where we are is Christian Smith, the sociologist of religion at the University of Notre Dame. He is best known, I think, for his phrase moralistic therapeutic deism, which he said is the de facto religion of Americans, whatever their denomination. And it, MTD is a simple religion. It, it has a few very simple commands. It believes God exists but it believes that God wants more than anything for us to be happy. Uh, we don't have to call on God unless we want something. And um, nobody goes to hell except Hitler, maybe Hitler. You know, and it, it's very trite to put it that way, but when I first read uh, Chris Smith talking about this in 2005, that's when his first book was published, I thought, you know what, that's the kind of Christianity in which I was raised in the 1970s in a small southern town. We didn't call it that, but it was basically a form of Christianity that was middle-class, small-town, white, southern life. You know, it's a, a baptized form of that. So I, I think that uh, when I try to tell, help people orient themselves to where Christianity is today, I say those thinkers uh, are, are so helpful because all of them talk about a world in which everything normative has been thrown off. We decide, or we believe it is our right and it is just normal to get rid of anything from the past that holds us back and keeps us from achieving the, the, what we desire. And in fact, we, we tend to look down on those who do say that, no, we have an obligation to a truth that exists outside of ourselves. You know, a lot of churches don't, don't teach that anymore or they're afraid to say it even if they believe it because they're afraid that people will walk away from them. So um, that, I think, those thinkers help define the dilemma that we're in, and so we can say more about it as we get into our conversation. You, uh, well, uh, Dr. Lightheart, you have a, a lot of background in theology and so forth. Do you see, um, uh, do you see points of, where you think there's a theological element in here? Has this, is this taking place in the church to the level that you, that you th that you see here? Are, are there yeah. correctives? Um, let me first of all thank uh, Matt Burford and uh, Tactical Faith for organizing the event and inviting Rod and myself here. And since uh, the Mike Wallace of the evening didn't introduce himself, um, the Mike Wallace here with his back to you is Dr. Travis Koblenz, so, uh, just so everyone knows who Dr. Travis is. Um, yeah, I think, I'd, I mean, my, my habit would be to uh, question the question, and what I'd want to I'd want to ask questions about uh, what we mean by post-Christian. Is that is that a um, is that an adequate description of where we are, and who is we when we're asking about who we are, where we are? Um, also, a question about the 
uh, uh, kind of utility or purpose of um, the genealogies that we tell, the stories that we tell about how we got to where we are. Um, I, mean, I think the, the question about post-Christian culture, it really depends on what sector of the world you're looking at. I think there are places in the world where we don't see a post-Christian culture, but kind of a nascently Christian culture coming to formation. So uh, we would have to limit ourselves to American culture, perhaps, or Western cultures, uh, thinking about that, but that still leaves a, a good bit of the world outside. Uh, and I think even there, even within the West, I think we have a complication uh, in talking about post-Christian culture because I, there are certain respects in which we're in a, I mean, post-secular is, is one of the terms that's thrown around to describe where we are currently. I mean, one of the big stories of the last half century globally has been the resurgence of religion, public religion into politics, Islam most obviously, but Christianity in a lot of, in a lot of areas of the world, Hinduism in India. So the resurgence of religion as a, as a public and political force, that's one of the stories of the present day. So um, it's not, it's, um, I, I think it just, that I'm just uh, suggesting that there's a, there are complications in talking about a, uh, a purely post-secular situation. The other, I think the more fundamental one that I'd want to bring up is um, a theological question. Um, to, uh, to put it simply, Jesus is ins unsurpassable. Um, Jesus died and rose again, and that's not being reversed. Jesus is king, uh, and has been king since he ascended into heaven to the right hand of the Father 2,000 years ago. That is the fact of the new covenant, and that's not gone away. So, and I think you could, that's a theological affirmation, but you can see how that plays out in certain respects in some of the cultural conflicts that we're talking about. I think of Tom Holland's dominion where in the latter chapters of his book, which is a history of the impact of the gospel and the Christian, Christian faith on Western civilization. But in the latter chapters, he describes how even the opponents today of Christianity are borrowing capital from Christianity. And so in some ways, the, the, uh, uh, the kind of woke movement is a charge to Christians that they aren't sufficiently Christian, uh, that they haven't, they haven't been sufficiently loving and uh, open and just to all kinds of people. So um, I think that, that has to be figured in. Whatever, whatever we say about um, the state of our culture, we need to recognize that, see that in the framework of Jesus is on the throne and he's not leaving. He's not going to leave until he comes again and, and establishes his throne. So, so that, let, me, let me say a couple words about, I, I, I do have a, a way of thinking about the, <coughs> the story, but let me say a couple things more abstractly about the, the questions about the kind of genealogies we tend to tell. Uh, I, I wonder about the theoretic, theoretical usefulness of them. Uh, Rod already mentioned this, that you, 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 go back, you can go back to the 19th century, or you can go back to Rousseau, or you can go back to the Reformation, or you can go back to the late medieval period, or you can go back to Pelagius. I mean, you can say Pela everything went wrong with Pelagius. There's always some predecessor uh, that had already set the ball rolling in the wrong direction. And so in some ways, the, uh, it, there's, a, there's a certain arbitrariness. There's not, nothing wrong with telling a particular story starting a particular race, but there's a certain arbitrariness about where we start, I think. Uh, and then I wonder about the practical use of that kind of story. So I'm, I'm, I'm questioning whether you're asking a useful question, Travis. Um, what are we supposed to do? Suppose we can locate exactly where things went wrong. So what do we do? We're still left with the world that we're in. That might give us some insight about where things went wrong and how things went wrong. But we can't go back to that point and redo it. Uh, we have to deal with the situation that we're in. So I think there's some use, there's some use in telling those stories, but I'm just, I'd, I'd start out raising some questions about uh, what, what is the theoretical or practical import of that and and how should we use those kinds of stories that we're telling? Well, you know, Peter, I, if I may, I, I think about a, a, a book I read a few years ago by Edward J. Watts, a historian, called The Final Pagan Generation. And it's about uh, the pagans in Rome of the fourth century as the Roman Empire was becoming Christian. Uh, and he tells a story based on documents that pagan elites uh, wrote starting at the beginning of that century. And he points out that none of them realized 
that they were on their last legs, that mm -hmm. things were flipping in a big way. Mm -hmm. We now can look back and see what was happening, but it was not at all apparent to them because they had, Rome had been pagan for many centuries. As far as they knew, Rome would always be pagan. Pagan temples were still everywhere. But of course, now we know that they were about to be extinguished. Um, and I, I think that, that that gives me a chill to read that because it makes me think of Christianity today. Of course, Jesus is going to be there. The fact that America is turning, increasingly turning her back on Christ doesn't mean that Christ goes away. But you go to Europe now and uh, go to the, the great churches and monasteries and they are museums, you know, and I hope that turns around, but that's just what they are. And um, but Africa and Asia increasingly are very different places, thanks be to God. Uh, we know that the gates of hell will not prevail against uh, the church, but that doesn't mean the gates of hell won't prevail against the church in America or Europe. Um, so I, I think that it's important for us to understand as Christians where we stand vis-a-vis uh, -vis history and what, what, what are the possible historical examples for us so we can take action now. We, we're not gonna be able to reverse time. We're not gonna be able to unlearn and unsee what we've seen. Um, for example, I am an Eastern Orthodox Christian. I've been Orthodox since 2006. Before that, I was Catholic for 13 years. And before that, I was raised Methodist. And uh, the fact that I've made this extraordinary journey, it's not an unusual one in our time. The religious churn in this country is enormous. I think uh, about 10 years ago, there was uh, some Pew research showing that something like 41% of all Americans are of a different religion or denomination than the one into which they were born. So we are all aware now, uh, to make a Charles Taylor point, we're aware that we could choose. We could choose which church we belong to, we could choose wh whether or not to believe in God in a way that just would have been unthinkable 500 years ago. So um, I think that as, as someone who's a father, who has children, who loves the church, who loves my people, as Matt was talking about his people, um, and I even love Nick Saban. I signed a book for him last night. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I want to know how we can preserve the faith in a time uh, not only of apostasy, but a time of what I, I fear will be persecution. Yeah, a, a few th responses to that. Um, uh, yeah, I wasn't denying that, uh, that things are very bad, particularly in, in Western Europe. Uh, I, I would say that there are complicating factors there, as I'm sure you'd acknowledge. Um, and I believe, I do believe that, that uh, as we like to say around the Theopolis, worlds die. World orders do cease to exist. And I, it, it feels like we're in the midst of that kind of turmoil, that uh, some, some kind of major epical transition is taking place. Uh, and... Uh, Politically, culturally, uh, ecclesi ecclesiologically, I think we're in the midst of that kind of major transition. I'm not denying that that's the case. Uh, and well, I think the question is, how do we, how do we frame that episode? Uh, and I think that it's, it's crucial in my mind, especially for American Christians for whom the story of America and the story of the church have been so intertwined. It's crucial for American Christians to have kind of an Augustinian outlook. Uh, Augustine, uh, treats the whole history of Rome in the city of God, including the Christianization of Rome. But the Christian is, even the Christianization of Rome becomes kind of a, an episode within a much, much larger story that he's telling, which begins with creation and Adam and the fall and ends with the New Jerusalem. So putting, putting what's happening now in that larger framework, I think is crucial. Uh, I do think that there are, there's a danger for American Christians to think that if, if the American church is collapsing, then the church is collapsing and the world is collapsing. Uh, so I think that's, that's crucial. The, the other, the other uh, thing I'd want to react to is the, the question about choice. I, have, uh, I wonder about that. I wonder how unique that is to our particular time. Uh, that's, a, that's a typical sociolog uh, sociology of religion point. Uh, Peter Berger makes that point in various writings about the heretical imperative, modernity places on us the burden of choice. Um, but it seems like you have uh, a, not an unsimilar situation in the early church. I mean, the early church had, uh, early Christians had options. They knew that they weren't the only show in town. Uh, and yet they uh, courageously and confidently held to the faith. So uh, even though they knew, there was a lot of cultural pressure to conform to the existing religious outlook. 
uh, and yet they, were, they, they held to this very countercultural position. So I, I just wonder how unique that position of choice is. I think there's some unique aspects to it in modernity, but I, I think the church has faced that particular, that particular challenge before. Well, I, uh, the idea of, I kind of want to jump back to this idea of being a tourist as well. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Joseph Pieper's work, and he talks about hope, and hope is this experience of being on the way, like a pilgrim. And once that ceases, once, once there's an element of ceasing, there's uh, ceasing to be on the way, the thou shalt nots also fall away, because there's no, there's no strictures, there's no constraints on where you go, there's no straight and narrow, you just peruse. And while that gives us a sense of pleasure, it also results, he would just call that despair. You're, we're in a state of despair. And so given that, that mixed with the resurgence of kind of a religious fervor, and, and we could talk about a lot of the religious fervor that's going on in our society right now, um, there's arguments out there that a lot of the new social concerns related to mm -hmm. social justice is a kind of religion. It's a, like you mentioned, it's a, uh, it's a tell, it's Christians being told they're not Christian enough, and is this is this a kind of thing that can that is a is, it, is in competition with Christianity? Is it a danger to Christianity? Uh, I know this is multiple questions. Is it a danger to Christianity, and how should we respond to these kinds of pressures that are going on in a contemporary society? Well, you know, I, I think of the year, it's around the year 2000, the the now late Rene Girard, the cultural uh, uh, analyst out at Stanford, he wrote a book called I Saw Satan Fall Like Lightning. He was a Christian himself, a very sophisticated man, but he said that he could already see coalescing now in the West um, a, a type of anti-Christianity that was going to be the, the uh, fulfill the anti, what the Antichrist is supposed to be. The Antichrist, when he comes, will be uh, a mockery of Christ. He will be more Christian than Christ. And Gerard saw, seeing, looking at these, um, these liberation movements, we now call woke social justice warrior, that, that sort of thing, he saw it already coming and he said, they're claiming to be more Christian than Jesus was. And this is precisely what the Antichrist is going to be. I thought about, the reason this comes up now to my mind is just the other day, there was a guy named Brandon Robertson. He's a young gay pastor uh, evangelical who made a TikTok video in which he talked about how Jesus was a racist. He said he saw the Syrophoenician woman and you know, he said, uh, the, the dogs under your table are not your, I'll give you crumbs from the table. And she spoke truth to power, he said, and Jesus repented of his racism. And I thought that is the Antichrist that Ger Ray Gerard was talking about, how the Syrophoenician woman and this woke young pastor are more Christian than Christ. And so I, I think that is a unique a, a unique period, or a, a unique uh, situation for us. And I do think that the, the uh, both wokeness on the left uh, is a pseudo, -re a political religion, a pseudo religion that uh, has its own characteristics. But you know, we know from the 20th century that uh, Nazism and communism were both uh, pseudo, or political pseudo religions. I think that this, these, that is an ideology that is taking the place and the moral fervor of what used to belong to Christianity, but they have a wokeness and critical social justice has a different anthropology. It says something, it's a rival anthropology. It's not like an improvement on Christianity. It's something very different. I think also it would be remiss if I didn't mention that QAnon and some of these other popular cult-like things that have popped up on the right plays the same role. Uh, it, and it doesn't have the same sort of cultural power that critical social justice on the left does. The QAnon people have no institutions, whereas the critical social, social justice people are taking over all the institutions and the means of cultural production. Nevertheless, I think that as people fall away, Americans fall away from traditional Christianity, they're looking for something to give their lives purpose and meaning, and they're finding it in politics within the church, people in the church, different people are bringing in political concerns as a way to revivify uh, banal and exhausted bourgeois Christianity. That's my fear. Yeah, I think that uh, just to go back to the comment that I made, you picked up on the 
Um, G.K. Chesterton makes a point somewhere, probably in Orthodoxy, that uh, uh, we're, the, the world is awash and Christian virtues run mad. They're all detached from one another and they're not part of the cohesive dogmatic or doctrine or liturgical framework, but there are still Christian virtues that are running mad. And I do think that that's, uh, that's what we see in some of these woke movements. Uh, one of the, I think one of the most illuminating recent books is uh, Tara Isabella Burton's book, um, the title of which I've forgotten. Uh, Strange Rights. Yeah, Strange Rights. R I T E S. Yeah, um, Strange Rights. Uh, and she's talking about contemporary religion, um, some very, very odd things. You know, Harry Potter, there's a, there's a kind of a cult of Harry Potter these days. Um, but one of the things she says is that there are the rivals that she sees for kind of the established religion for American society is um, uh, social justice as, a, uh, as an established religion, that, an ideology that determines law and culture and education and the direction of scholarship and all kinds of things, which we see. The other one is techno-utopianism uh, that uh, she thinks is a rival for um, established religion. And, and I do think that that's true. I think you had, the question was whether these are rivals to the church. I think absolutely yes. And I think in, in some ways, I'm, I'm, I, I tend to look at movements like this and think uh, my, uh, uh, at least along the way of thinking about them, there's a question of what is this exposing about the weaknesses and failures of the Christian church? What are we not doing? That, uh, why, why are young people, uh, even some young Christians, being caught up in this kind of agitation? And I, I, think, it, I think there is something to um, you start out with hope. I think there's something about the, um, uh, the vision that, that uh, a, social, uh, a social justice movement has for uh, changing the world, affecting the world. There's a, there's a vision for sacrifice and uh, uh, giving yourself to something much larger than yourself. And I'm, I think uh, going back to Rod's earlier comments about the therapeutic culture invading the church, I think the church doesn't do that. Uh, partly because it's taken up this therapeutic. Uh, and there's no sense that you come into the church and you're part of this mission uh, to, uh, you know, uh, spread the gospel and conquer the world for Jesus and to see God's justice um, uh, enacted in the world. That's, that's not the vision that you have when you come into many churches. So people find that al- elsewhere. And I think that's in some ways an <coughs> indictment of the kind of the softness and the therapeutic t- tendencies of Christianity today. Can I touch up in on that? When, when I was in Russia in the fall of 2019 interviewing people for my book, Live Not By Lies, people who had endured communism, I'd, I'd gone out to a, a place on one of my first days there south of Moscow. It's where the National Monument to, the, um, to the, all the victims of political violence under communism is. It's on a field where the KGB in a 14-month period in the 1930s uh, murdered 21,000 people and including a number of Christians. And um, I mean, I, I saw that and talked to other people. I was just completely bowled over by the, the intensity of it all. And I, I went to dinner in the home of a Russian family, Orthodox Christians. And uh, I, I said, typical naive American, I said, gosh, you know, I just don't understand why anybody ever believed anything the Bolsheviks had to say. And the father at the end of the table says, you wanna know why? And he said that um, we went back to the beginning, the, the founding, founding of the Romanov dynasty. <laughs> and he gave you this history, long history of, of Russia and of the poor being constantly exploited and ground down and of the, the uh, powers in the church uh, being complicit with the, the monarchy in, in doing this to the poor. And, and he said, so we get to the late 19th century and the, here come the Marxists, and they, they're promising a better world, justice for us, and, and the church was so pretty decadent by then, and so people believed them. And he said, and of course we were wrong to do that. Our forefathers were wrong to do that, but you have to understand where they came from. They were so desperate, and the Marxists offered them hope. It was false hope, it was demonic hope, but it was hope, and it spoke to them where they were. And that really got to me, you know, because, and it made me think in a way, we're not living in that kind of world now here in contemporary America, but what you said just now, Peter, really makes sense to me, that if, if people only see, young people especially, only see what the Christian churches have to offer as 
mere moralism or bourgeois conformity, they're right to rebel against that. Mm -hmm. They really are. In my own case, I thought when I was, I was born in 67, when, by the time I got to be 17 years old, you know, I thought my only choices were the sort of middle class conformity of the church in which I was raised and to which we did not go except on Easter and Christmas, or Jimmy Swaggart, who was the, the TV evangelist who was a big deal in Louisiana back then. Um, it wasn't until I wandered into the cathedral at Chartres in France on a trip my mom wanted a church raffle. I was the only young kid on a bus full of elderly American tourists. We got off the bus and wandered in there like tourists, and I beheld the glory of God in the stones and the glass of that medieval cathedral. And it completely overwhelmed all of my categories. There was nothing in my life as a 20th, late 20th century small town American that prepared me for meeting God there. And that was the thing that turned me around. I didn't walk out of there as a Christian, but I walked out of there knowing that God existed in a way that I never had before and knowing that he wanted me. And uh, it took years, but I finally gave my life fully to Christ. But it was that experience of awe that did it. And a sense of awe. And there, were, look, there were thousands of people who go into that cathedral every week and no, don't have that experience. Mm -hmm. But God reached me, and I don't want to overthink it because it was real. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what we have to start doing in the church now. We have to start giving young people this experience of awe. You can experience it in art or in architecture, as I did, or you can experience it in the lives of the saints. Some of these people I met in, um, in Eastern Europe and Russia researching this book, none, they're all still alive. They're not canonized saints, but some of them have been canonized. And it just, it, it's incredible to hear about their lives and to sit there and talk to men and women who were in prison for their faith. And it, it lifted me out of myself and made me realize this is what it means to be a Christian. As an Orthodox Christian too, we are immersed in the lives of the saints, especially of the early church. And that too is a reminder that it ain't just about us right here, right now. Well, I mean, this, one of the things I really wanted to focus on was whether the culture, uh, much of the cultural shifts, the zeal that exists in our culture is offering to people things they haven't had before. So a lot of the response that I experienced in my, in my younger days and in a lot of churches, and I don't want to make anyone too angry out here, uh, was that in response to shifts away from Christianity, we, you know, maybe we put a coffee bar in the church, we put, and I, I play electric guitar, I like me some electric guitar, but um, you know, get a, get a nice band up there and so on and so forth. And my own experience, and I'm not trying to convert anyone here, was I entered a, a church that was kind of a high liturgy, liturgy church and it had a tremendous impact on me. Um, uh, and so how do, we, how do we as the church begin to, begin to present this kind of depth? Um, my experience growing up, you might say something like this, my, my job was to not sin too much and share the gospel with people. But I never really got on fire for that. I mean, I had moments, but it, it was hard to, to craft a life purpose around that if I, were, if I were not to go into ministry. And so I felt I spent most of my life confused until I ran into Nietzsche and Plato and they helped me with my Christianity, <laughs> um, ironically. But, uh, but so... What, what do we as a church need to begin doing? And, and you spent a lot of time in Live Not By Lies, which y'all should read, it's a great book, talking about this sort of thing, about uh, how do we begin to, and, and how do we begin to prepare? You know, I, I have people that I know who are friends who started going down the SJW route, and it wasn't, it was a matter of a year, a few years, and now they don't believe in God anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's sort of like one thing got, there's not room for, maybe there's not room for both, I don't know, that's a debate. Um, and so, uh, what do we as a church, what, what, have, what do we need to change? I guess if there's one major thing we need to change about how we present Christianity, or maybe multiple things, what specifically should we start doing? Is it something the church broadly needs to do? Is it something we need to do as local, uh, local churches? Is it something we need to be doing in our families? Uh, it's kind of an open question, but... You want to take it mean? first? You go ahead. Well... <clears throat> I didn't intend it this way, but the last two books I've written, The Benedict Option, which came out uh, on this Sunday, will be the fourth anniversary of it, and now Live Not By Lies, are telling the same story from two different angles. 
In the Benedict Option, I, I got the title of the book and the concept from uh, a famous book of moral, contemporary moral philosophy, After Virtue, by Alistair McIntyre. And McIntyre says that you know we live in a time in which uh, of great moral confusion, and there's no um, agreed upon source of moral authority, and it's just part of what it means to be post-Christian. And he, he he's best known for the last paragraph, the last couple of paragraphs of that of that book, in which he compares our time to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And uh, he says that uh, a, 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 there was a great shift when uh, certain people began to see that this thing was, not, was, was falling apart, and they went out to the woods, not quite knowing what they were doing, but they, they formed communities within which the tradition of the virtues, that's the language he used, he wasn't a Christian then, um, could survive the dark ages to come. And he's talking about the Benedictine monks who did in fact emerge out of the collapse of the Roman Empire. And uh, McIntyre ends by saying, we await um, not Godot, but a new and doubtless very different St. Benedict. Well, I said, what would St. Benedict, I said to myself, if we had a new St. Benedict come among us today, to, uh, what would he say? Because I believe that we are living in a, in a late Rome situation. This is a decadent civilization, uh, decadent in, in, uh, in all kinds of ways. I don't think anybody really has a lot of faith that this is going to last. So what do we do as Christians about that? If we, we're not called to the monastery, we have to live in the world. One of the things that drives me crazy as Travis is People who've not read my book, Benedict Option, they say, well, you're talking about heading to the hills. And we're like, no, I'm not talking about heading to the hills. Read the book. I believe that we, are, we Christians are now have to live like the Hebrews in their Babylonian exile. God, speaking to the prophet Jeremiah, told them, you know, to, I brought you here for a purpose. Um, dwell here in the city, take wives, and pay, pray for the peace of the city. Well, I think that's where, where we are too. We lay Christians. On the other hand, if you read in the book of Daniel, we know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were Hebrews who were so embedded in that society, they were servants of the king, advisors to the king. And yet, when they were asked to apostatize and bow down before the false idol, they chose the prospect of death before abandoning the true God. We, even as we live in a Jeremiah 29 world, we have to be living in such a way in our daily lives that we form ourselves to be able to see apostasy when it is put in front of us and to know what we must not do and to have the courage and the faith to accept death, to accept martyrdom before abandoning God. That's very, very stark, but I think that's where we are. So how do we get to that point? I think uh, and very briefly and very broadly, the Benedict option is about Christians, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, going deeper into their traditions uh, to root ourselves in traditions so we will not be brought, uh, be disordered or be captured in modernity's disorder. We need to live lives of spiritual discipleship, great discipline, and we need to do so in small groups. So um, we, we have, we're not just out there doing it alone. This is not a guarantee, it's no escape from the world. But it does, if we do it right, and I, I write in the book about communities that are doing it right, um, we can live in the world as faithful icons of Christ. We can, um, and that does require stepping back from the world somewhat and realizing there's things we can't do. Last night I had dinner, uh, one of the people at dinner was uh, Jeremiah Castile, the chaplain for the uh, Crimson Tide. And uh, he talked about being a Christian in the NFL as a rookie. And he was at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and one thing the coach did, he brought a bunch of strippers in for the players. And Jeremiah said, I'm a child of God. I don't belong here. And he turned around and he walked out. And he believes that got him cut from the team because the team said, oh, he's not one of us. Well, please, God, let us live in such a way that when we are put on the spot like that, we have the courage and the presence of mind to choose God, even if it costs us friendships, even if it costs us our job, and even as in the case of the, um, the Catholic martyr Franz Jägerstater, uh, the, uh, whose Terence Malick made this film A Hidden Life about him, even if it costs us our life, that 
broadly speaking, it's what the church needs to do. We need to have this radical countercultural and even somewhat separatist mentality, even as we know we can't head for the hills because there's no escaping this, that modernity will find us. Yeah, I agree completely about the need for uh, a readiness for martyrdom. Um, that martyrdom may, may take uh, comparatively mild forms. Um, it might take the form of not getting promotions not being able to pursue a career, uh, losing a job, losing a career because you're refusing to do something or protesting something. But that's still a form of martyrdom. It's a form of suffering witness that I think uh, absolutely that's, uh, uh, I do think that's what we're facing. But I, I, I want to uh, kind of step, uh, maybe step a, uh, 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 take a step back or uh, go, go down a, another level and suggest that I'm, rather than asking or starting with what the church does, I think we need to think about what the church is and what it means to be what the church is. The church, um, just in terms of martyrdom, that's something that you, gotta, you have to be practiced, you have to be ready for, you have to be taught, you have to, be, you have, to have examples, uh, models for that. Um, but fundamentally, uh, martyrdom is a sharing in the sufferings of Christ. You're following a crucified Savior and you're a member of his body, and you're conformed to him because you're a member of his body being conformed to Christ by the Holy Spirit. Um, so on, on that point, the, it's not just a matter of you need to have this kind of instruction, this kind of preparation, but there needs to be this reality of communion with Jesus uh, together as a body, a communion with the crucified Jesus, and knowing that, that you know, we follow a Savior who calls us to take up our cross and follow him. And I would say that, that kind of across the board, that the, the question is more fundamentally about what the church is, the church as the body of Christ, the church as the, um, the, the present form of, this, of the heavenly city uh, in the world, the, the church as the presence of God. Um, all those things are true of the church, and that's what we're called to be. All the things that we do are various ways that we express and manifest and deepen that reality. Uh, and um, the other thing I would want to say, too, is that just a reminder that the, the, the weapons that we currently have at our disposal are, Paul says, weapons that are powerful for tearing down fortresses and casting on every lofty imagination that, that sets itself against Christ. Those are the weapons that we currently possess. Uh, we apparently aren't using them very well. Uh, so it's not, it's not for lack of tools it's for lack of use of the tools and the weapons that we currently have. And I'm, you know, I think about uh, the word. Uh, is the word taught and preached in churches? Uh, I think uh, communion at the Lord's table, the Eucharist, is, is a community building, a body building event that binds us together with Christ. We're, we're sharing the body and blood of the crucified Jesus when we share in the Eucharist. That means we're being conformed to his death. We are being made martyrs every time we sit down at the Lord's table. Um, if we're sitting down at the Lord's table, and many churches were not very often. So uh, that's, part of the, that's part of the formation of this reality. Uh, prayer, I mean, uh, prayer is, a, uh, is perhaps the chief weapon that we have against principalities and powers. Um, so all of these two, I mean, the Ephesians 6 uh, panoply of spiritual, for spiritual warfare, those things are things we already possess Nobody as at this point is preventing us from using them. Um, and I think the church is just un unfaithful in uh, deploying those weapons uh, and, uh, and using them the way that God has called us to. So I think that, so those are the two things of, uh, just, to, just to summarize. Um, you know, the preacher habit of summarizing what you just said, sorry. Um, what the, the fundamental question is what the church is and recognizing who we, who we are in Christ as the body of Christ. And then recognizing, as Eli, Elisha says to his servant, there are more with us than with him. You know, uh, it's already the case that the hosts of God are on our side, not, not on the side of our enemies. Uh, and as we uh, seek his face and serve faithfully, then he'll, uh, you know, his enemies will put our enemies, to, his hosts will put our enemies to flight. I think that this, this is, the, I'm sorry, were you done? No, I was. Yeah. I think this is the... I came to my summary, so yeah, that was, <laughs> you knew I was 
the point three, I got the point three. I think this is the key, though, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning about the, we live in a therapeutic culture. Um, when I was in the former Soviet bloc interviewing Christians who went through the persecution of the communist years, it became very clear to me that the key thing that we lack now in the church in the West, in the modern church, is an understanding of suffering, a theology of suffering. This is something that has been there since our Lord achieved, you know, he rescued us by being willing to suffer and die and through his resurrection. But we have somehow gotten ourselves into a point in our, in this, in our culture today where suffering is something to be completely avoided. It has no meaning. You have to run away from it. And um, this has infected the church certainly, but this is also everywhere in our culture. That's what it means to live in a therapeutic culture. I tell a story in Live Not By Lies about uh, being in Hungary on, on the tram in Budapest, heading to interview a woman who had been persecuted. And my translator is a young woman who grew up after the fall of communism. Um, she was recently married for five years, had a little boy, and she was she's Catholic. And she was telling me how difficult it is for her to find friends in whom she can confide about the struggle she has in her marriage and being a mom, just completely ordinary struggles. She said, when I talk to my friends, even my Catholic friends, and I begin to, to say, oh, I'm really struggling here, they immediately say, well, get a divorce or put your son in daycare and go back to the office. She said, they won't even hear me out. You know, they, they, they think the idea that I would have to do anything that's hard and makes me anxious or unhappy, that it, may ha it may has no meaning at all, none. And uh, I looked at her and said, Anna, it sounds like you're fighting for your right to be unhappy. She said, that's exactly right. Where did you get that? Pulled out my phone and went to chapter 17 of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, which is on at Huxley.net. <laughs> and that's a scene in, in, in the, the dystopian novel where John the Savage, who's the dissident who lives out in the woods, he meets Mustafa Mann, the world controller of this dystopian state where, unlike in Orwell's 1984, where the, the state maintains control by making people afraid and inflicting pain and terror on them, in Huxley's dystopia, the state controls people by manipulating their pleasures and their comforts. And um, the, the, the savage comes and Mustafa Mann says to him, why wouldn't you want to join us? We give you Christianity without tears. That's the line he uses, Christianity without tears. You have all the pleasures you want. You don't have to worry about anything. And the savage says, I, I want sin. I want joy. I want God. I want love. I want, you know, I want art, poetry, and so on. And Mon looks at him and says, it sounds like you're fighting for the right to be unhappy. He goes, yes, I'm trying to, I'm fighting for the right to be unhappy. Mon says, you're welcome to it. Well, I think this is important for us today because being unhappy is seen as something, or being anxious is something to be terrified of. A lot of people come to the church, as my old priest used to put it, people come seeking solace and relief from their pain. They're, some of them come wanting an analgesic, wanting an opioid, to not deal with the pain, but rather to escape the pain, when what they really need is surgery that might intensify the pain at first, but then you can have real healing. I think that we have got to start talking about suffering as not something to be avoided, but as something that God sends us for our own sanctification and our own salvation. That's a radical message. And as Father Kirill Kaleda, the priest who, who uh, pastors the church there in Russia by the, the, the place where all those people were killed, he said, look, we're not called to seek out suffering, but if it comes to us, we have to be prepared for it. Uh, Yuri Sipko, a Russian Baptist leader, told me, he said, you go home to America and you tell people that if they're not prepared to suffer for their faith, then their faith is nothing but hypocrisy. I think that is the, the, the core right there that if we're not, given what's coming in this society, what's here now and what's coming, if we are not prepared and have not been discipled to suffer and to call it uh, and to figure out a way to turn this, uh, to join our suffering with Christ, then we're not going to make it. Last point, I, I, I'd say, tell in the book the story of Dr. Sylvester Kirchmeri. He was a young Catholic in Slovakia who was one of the founders of the underground church. 
And he wrote a memoir in 1996 called This Saved Us, about how he survived prison, where he was tortured for 10 years with other Christians. And uh, it was all about suffering and learning. He, he said, when I was thrown in the prison, I knew that I could never feel sorry for myself, because if I did that, the bottom would fall out. And he said, I, I saw myself as God's probe. I'm here to learn something about the world and to witness to others and to offer my sufferings to Christ for his glory and for my salvation, for my, my, uh, my sanctification. And that's how he did it. And he also knew that he could not allow himself to hate his captors or he would betray Christ. It, it is a simple thing, but it's the hardest thing in the world. And it is so far removed from the kind of teaching we get in most American churches today, but that was the only thing that saved them under persecution is adopting that attitude towards suffering, that suffering as a means of sanctification. Well, gentlemen, I thank you uh, for that. I want, uh, we've got a few questions that uh, folks in the audience have written down. Uh, we filtered out hopefully all the bad ones, so if you don't hear yours. Um, so, uh, so I'm just gonna read these. I might add a little bit to it because I can't help myself. Uh, this first one is, has the church lost its ability to address social justice issues? If not, how might we seek justice in a biblical way without participating in the broader culture's project? Yeah, I'll say a few words about that. Um, the first part of the question, repeat that, how, how it was put. Has the church lost its ability to address social justice issues, perhaps because of the history of the church? Uh, yeah, under yeah. Well, I think that uh, there may, you know, that could have a... Um, there's, there may be things that the church needs to repent of. I acknowledge that. Um, but I think that well, I, I think it's important that uh, Christians not be spooked by the misuse of the language of justice um, because justice is such a prominent theme in Scripture. It's part of the promise of the gospel. It's, I mean, uh, we, get, we, get, uh, we avoid thinking about it because we have Bibles that, use translations, uh, translate the word for justice as righteousness, and that we transfer that into kind of private morality often. But it's the same, it's the same word group in Hebrew and in Greek. So the Bible's constantly talking about justice, and the prophecy of Isaiah is, talks about the salvation of God coming, and it's the coming of God's justice. Jesus talks about uh, us pursuing a justice that's beyond that of the scribes and Pharisees. It's translated as righteousness, but it's the same word. Paul says that we're baptized and brought to new life in baptism so that we can devote the members of our body uh, to justice rather than injustice. So that's, constant, that's a constant theme of Scripture. Uh, so we shouldn't cede that to those who are distorting it. Uh, I think that it is, it is important that we recognize the distinction, um, and distinction between a, a biblical conception of justice and the, what passes for justice in, uh, in current in current political climate. That doesn't mean there, there might be overlaps of various kinds, but the Bible has its own uh, perspective on justice that I think is, uh, there'd be a, a couple things that I, w I think are uh, uh, maybe distinctive to it. One would be uh, 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 the fact that justice is a gift of grace. It's something that, that God gives us and enables us to achieve. Uh, justice as a characteristic of the community of the church, I think that's an important uh, feature of biblical justice that there is uh, right is done within the community of believers and the just society, the model just society should be the church. I mean, you see that in the book of Acts with the, the way that uh, um, uh, various conflicts are dealt with, the way that uh, neglect of the poor is dealt with, the way the, the poor are uh, provided for. All those are aspects of righteousness or justice. And uh, it's, it's the community of the church that is... Uh, that is called to do that. And I think too that, you know, the, uh, the, the kinds of things that Jesus enumerates when he talks about the justice that, that uh, surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees are acts of righteousness that uh, occur within kind of um, hidden, uh, uh, away, from the, away, from the, uh, away from the scrutiny of the media, you know. Um, Instead of, uh, 
instead of reacting to somebody who shames you, you turn the other cheek. No, that's not going to get on. That's not going to get on the news. But that's an act of justice that inverts and undoes an act of injustice and advances the justice of God. So I think a great deal of what we do that is advancing God's justice is the way we deal with one another in kind of private and everyday kinds of concerns. Uh, and I think one of the problems with the, uh, with the social justice movement is precisely that it's a movement and you have this, it's a, it's, a, it's a camera hog. They're looking for ways to display their commitment to justice. And I think Jesus calls us to all kinds of secret, um, secret righteousness that uh, no one will ever see. Yeah, I, I think the, those are all good points. And I, I go back to what the Russian, my Russian host said about the revolution came on Russia in, in large part because the church did not stand against the social injustice in, in Tsarist Russia. But uh, I think that we need to remember that the term social justice, if I'm not mistaken, was coined by a Catholic priest, a Jesuit in the 19th century. So the concept itself, the modern concept, comes out of the Catholic Church. The difference is, as, as Peter uh, was talking about, is the idea of biblical justice is very different from the secular contemporary model of social justice. One way it's different, and, and this is hugely important, is it finds sin and injustice in groups. And it, it, it holds out certain groups as being bearers of injustice, oppressors, and as, as goats and other groups as the sheep. Not on the virtue basis of what they have done or have not done, but on the basis of who they are, the color of their skin. Um, in Russia, when the Bolsheviks came, it was about social class. And Live Not By Lies, I cite a, a quote by Martin Latsis, who was a, a high official of the predecessor of the KGB. In 1918, he was giving instructions for carrying out the Red Terror, in which Lenin and the Bolsheviks massacred and or sent to the gulags their enemies to, gain, to solidify control over Russia. And Lats said, when you go out into the field, don't ask if individuals are guilty or not. Rather, ask what social class do they belong to. They're the wrong social class, then they're guilty. That is the essence, he said, of the Red Terror. Well, that same philosophy is being used now to determine who is on the side of justice and who isn't. Individual conduct, individual disposition does not matter. And that cannot be just from a Christian point of view. Uh, I think we have to think about justice socially and otherwise is about right order, rightly ordering the world under God. So abortion in that case is a social justice issue. There can be no social justice for the Christian that says abortion is good or at least morally neutral. That is socially unjust. Racism is socially unjust. We, we understand that, but we have to think of it in in a very different way than contemporary social justice warriors are thinking about it. And I think it comes down to having to ask ourselves, what is man? How, how are we created? And there, this is really an anthropological issue deep down. Uh, finally, we have to remember what Solzhenitsyn said. He said one thing he learned in the Gulag was the line between good and evil does not go between social classes. Uh, it goes right down the middle of every human heart. And this is the key principle, I think, of Christian social justice. You can't have any a truly just order without every single person having to recognize their own sin, their own capacity for sinfulness, and out of that, commit themselves to mercy. Back when I was struggling uh, some years ago, and I tell the story on how Dante can save your life, uh, I was back home in Louisiana, I'd moved back, and I was struggling mightily with my dad who did not love me in the way I thought I deserved to be loved because of his own limitations. And I would go to confession and have to confess to my priest that I was just so filled with anger at my dad. My priest said, uh, I was confessing it, this is my sin. The priest said, what do you want? I said, I want justice. I want him to treat me like I deserve to be treated. My priest said, what is justice? You know, your sins put Christ on the cross, and he loved you anyway. You've got to see your father that way. I'm not telling you, he said, to put up with him uh, abusing you in any way, which my dad didn't do, but you have a responsibility under God to love your father despite his failings and despite him not giving you what you think is just, because that is how Jesus Christ loves you. 
And that was profoundly convicting. So in the case of me and my dad, social justice required me to have to recognize my own sin against God, my own injustice towards God, and to have to take the mercy that God gave me as a sinner, as a repentant sinner, and extend the same thing to my father. And thank God I, I didn't want to do that, but I did it out of obedience to my priest. And thank God for it, because before my dad died, I was able to be there when he apologized to me before for, for the way he had treated me, and I was able to spend the last eight days of his life in home hospice with him in his bedroom, uh, living there with him, uh, ministering to him, nursing him, and I was holding his hand when he breathed his last. That would not have happened had I not come home and had to fa had been hit square over the head with the injustice of our whole relationship, our whole life together, and had been led by the Holy Spirit speaking in part through Dante and speaking apart through my confessor to realize the higher justice involves mercy. Yeah, Thus the, ended the sermon. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not supposed to add anything, but I think it's, what's interesting is I always believed uh, growing up that justice would happen when Jesus returned and beat up all the bad guys. Uh, Nietzsche talks about this in his Genealogy of Morals a lot. Um, how we're filled with resentment and we can't wait until God comes and just tortures those people who, you know, took away our lunch money when we were young. <laughs> and, uh, but I realized more and more that justice is manifest in Jesus on the cross, um, which is very uncomfortable for me, so let's move on. <laughs> uh, uh, so this one asks, uh, is the new secular order, that is the neoliberalism which gave birth to the United States, the greatest threat to the church? It seems to put all religions on the same plane, so creating kind of a shopping center mentality with religion, uh, so I can pick and choose what I believe. I, it may be that Plato talks about this in the Republic when he's talking about the democratic society, which is the second most unjust society, where their hierarchy gets undermined. <coughs> There's no sense of hierarchy or transcendence. Um, so is the secular order that gave birth to the United States, is that the problem? Uh, do we need to have a different, maybe, go a more Constantinian route. Um, would that be better? You first. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that there's, a, there's definitely a, um, I think there's a, 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 I'll call it a flaw in the uh, formation of early modern liberal order. Um, I mean, this was gonna be, if, if I had offered a genealogy, this would have been part of the genealogy. Uh, they, that the Reformation, I think it's part of I'm a Protestant, but the Reformation is part of the, one of the early dislocations that uh, has produced some of the, some of the uh, consequences and the fruit that we currently see. One of those dislocations is uh, the Reformation at least was the pretext and religious war that followed the Reformation was the pretext for forming secular political orders and, 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 uh, and purging uh, political life of uh, distinctively theological claims. So the only way we could keep peace between Catholics and Protestants, between Lutherans and Reformed, would be to have a, 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 uh, a thinned out, if there is any public philosophy at all, it has to be extremely thin, something that we can all believe, agree on, and that means it can't have any particular theological content, and particularly when you get to a pluralistic polity where you have uh, not just diversity of Christians, but you have other faiths, then how do you organize a polity that doesn't have, uh, uh, but, but the effect of that, so that, that, that's the, at least the pretext for, for a, a secular polity is the, is the threat of religious violence. Uh, whether, whether the religious violence, whether the violence is actually caused by the religion is another question, but the pretext for purging theological content from the political life is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is violence and religious war. So, uh, and I think that the effect of that is to uh, push uh, religious life into a private space, a domestic space, uh, to create a, um, maybe not a naked public square, because I think there's still some form of sacred, often the nation itself takes the, takes the place of whatever uh, divine sacred used to occupy that space. But you create this, you create this space that uh, has no transcendent reference point, it has no theological ground. And I do, I do think that the U.S. Uh, system, uh, as, a, as a constitutional system, 
does buy into that to some degree. So uh, you can read some of the early discussions, uh, Madison talking about the, uh, the First Amendment, and the argument is often that, that line of argument. It's religious violence we have to avoid. The reason why we have to have a, have a, uh, a, a, a kind of neutral, federal, a religiously neutral federal, go federal government is because we need, to, we need to parry the threat of religious violence. The, 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 the counterforce, of course, in the United States was that the vast majority of uh, people were Christians. The institutions functioned Christianly. The laws were based in Christianity. So there's a de kind of de facto Christian establishment, but the system itself was, uh, at least the federal system, is set up to be religiously neutral. So I think that there's a, there is a kind of contradiction. To my mind, there's a, there's a tension at the heart of the American system that... Um, to some degree, that's, that's in the background of the problems we, we're, we're struggling with currently. But yeah, I, I think about how divided I am on this question between, on the one hand, David French, who is a conservative evangelical commenter, who believes that we can, as Christians, we can defend and, and defend our rights within the current liberal order, and his antagonist, Saurabh Amari, who was a Catholic convert, who seeks some, something more like an uh, integralist order, an order that is confessional, and for him it's gonna be Catholic. Um, I think that, you know, I, I can see all the problems with liberalism and decadent liberalism, but at the same time, I, I worry with David French that if we don't have the Constitution, you know, people like me are religious minorities. Christians are gonna be minority, and if we don't have the First Amendment, what are we, what's gonna protect us when, when the, the mob comes after us? And I think about the, the Catholic integralists I know um, who believe you know, in a confessional state, Catholic state, I'm not a Catholic. I don't want to give them the right to tell me what I can and can't do. So who is it? You know, if I were in Russia, which is a majority Orthodox country, I don't want the state to persecute Russian Baptists, which has happened. You know, so it's, it's a weird thing to be, I'm so formed by the liberal spirit, classically liberal spirit, and, uh, but I, I, go, I fall back also on what John Adams said in his letter to the Mass Massachusetts uh, uh, militia, I think it was. He said that our constitution is formed by, for a moral and religious people, but it is wholly inadequate for any other. Um, and I think we have reached that, the implications of what Adams had to say, that you know, if, if we do not, if we aren't bound internally by a shared commitment to Christ, however nominal it is, um, then, our, th then we, are, we get what we have today. And I don't think it can last, but I don't know what replaces it and what, what kind of order would be better than this decadent liberalism. Yeah, if I could uh, throw something back at that. I, I, I agree that in the current situation that we make use of all the political and legal tools that we have, uh, very grateful for the First Amendment. Um, the, my, my point was a somewhat more theoretical and historical one. I do think that there's, a, there's some flaws at the, at the heart of the... I take, I take the American Constitution as being an expression of liberalism in some respects. And so I think there's, a, there's some tension at the heart of it. The, the other question about, you know, um, I mean, you, you have your own Orthodox countries that you could go to. So uh, if, if, the, if there was a Catholic takeover here in the States, I mean, you have other, <laughs> other places to go. Um, but I mean, that, is a, that is a question. How do you, how do you have any kind of uh, transcendence, religious theological underpinnings for political order uh, that, that provides any kind of, you know, that, that, uh, that bridges the divide and divides within the, within the church? I don't think you have. Uh, practically, you don't have a possibility for that unless you have a church that's far more united than it currently is. So I think that uh, I don't I don't envision a kind of I think you can have kind of you can have kind of local or national um, uh, syst uh, polities where uh, an acknowledgement of the kingship of Jesus. You have some countries in the in the in the world right now that acknowledge the king uh, King Jesus as the Lord of this country. Um, so that you can you can have that on a, on a local level. That, uh, or a national level that uh, provides some kind of toleration of a variety of different different uh, Christian groups. I think I think uh, doing that on any kind of significant scale would require a church that's much more at one than well, it currently is. Yeah, and, and this is what drives me nuts about the Catholic integralists. Yeah. You know, 
it's really just LARPing. You know, they want a Catholic social order, confessional state, but they can't even get Catholics themselves <laughs> to agree that what Rome teaches is true. I mean, functionally, in the United States, a Catholic church is a mainline Protestant yeah. uh, denomination. Not that on paper, but in reality it is. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I think work on converting and reconverting people in your own church. Yeah, right. And uh, this is something not just for the Catholics, but for all of us. And, and then we can talk about the political order. But yeah, until yeah. then, we, we have the, the scandal of disunity in the church is going to prevent any kind of uh, Christian state from emerging. <laughs> and can, I just said very quickly, um, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I think this has been part of the problem with American Christians on the right, conservatives like I am. We have thought for so long that if we just vote for the right person, get the right judges on the bench, everything will take care of itself. And we have neglected to form the, our, the generations of, of young people. We've fallen back on the idea that we are a Christian nation and we don't have to sit back and the problem is elites have taken it over and we get rid of the elites, everything's gonna, gonna be well. That was always false, and it is just risible now, and it's, it's dangerous to think that all we have to do is get the right political situation and everything is going to emerge properly. Well, uh, the question I was going to ask was whether Trump was the new Constantine, but uh, <laughs> I'll set that aside for now. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, your book, Live Not By Lies, is, is named after Solzhenitsyn's final talk that he gave to, uh, to the Russian people uh, when he was exiled. And, uh, th and this is sort of an epistemological question, maybe a practical question, maybe even sort of a liturgical question, but um, someone asked, how do we evaluate whether questions of facts or science, and not just doctrine or morality questions, but questions of facts of science, like, like the, the issue with masking and the pandemic has become so politicized that there's, there's a significant amount of de debate on, you know, a whole variety of issues related to this. Um, how do we determine uh, whether this stuff we're being told, um, and we could talk about everything, social justice issues, we can talk about issues about trans, uh, transgenderism, all this kind of, all, all, these, all this information we're told. Um, how do we determine if they've been answered with lies uh, the lies that we're, we're not to live by? Well, the, the core problem is one of authority, right? Um, scientific authority, political authority, religious authority. Nobody knows what to believe anymore. And uh, there's a phrase that keeps coming up. You hear it more and more. Oprah Winfrey, the, the high priestess of our therapeutic age, said it the other night. Uh, Megan is speaking of her truth, speaking her truth, mm -hmm. my truth, my truth. You know, nobody talks about truth, it's always my truth. And even people who laugh at my truth and, or sneer at my truth have that same mentality. I can remember, uh, I've gotten into political arguments with people about matters of fact. And they said, well, you have your, your opinion, I have my opinion. And I've said, wait, no, it's not a matter of opinion, these are about facts. And but the, even facts they put under the, under the umbrella of opinion. Hannah Arendt, the 20th century political theorist said this is a sign of a pre-totalitarian society. When people cease to care what is really true and to cease to be able to know what is true because they don't trust institutions and instead so, uh, replace that with believing the narrative that feels right to them. Even when they know that they, they, they have reason to know that this might not be factually true. They just believe what suits them. I would have thought myself that I was immune to that sort of thing. Not me, but I remember back when the Gulf War was, was under, we were marching up to, the, uh, to attack Iraq. I was living in New York City then. I was on, uh, downtown and watched the, the first tower fall in the World Trade Center. I was working in New York. And uh, I was so overcome with rage at what had been done to this country that I was ready to believe anything the government had to say to justify a war. And I can remember being in New York then when all this was going on, talking to other fellow conservatives, I worked at National Review then, and I thought, oh, these poor fools, the people like Pat Buchanan on the right and others on the left who are against the war, they're either cowardly or they're foolish. But we know what is right, we know they have weapons. 
I, was, I, I realized only later in repenting bitterly for what I had done that I had rationalized everything. I could not accept a truth that, or anything as true that got in the way of what I wanted to see happen, which is to see some Arab Muslim country suffer for what was done to us. I was wrong about that, but it, and that was such a shattering event for me personally about my, epistemologically, about my own ability to know what is true, that I have become much more cautious, maybe cautious to a fault about saying, yes, this is true, because we lie to ourselves all the time. Well, I think the key is to find the right Twitter followers. <laughs> and, uh, my, Twitter and, hand, my Twitter handle. Yeah. Um, well, I think that my, my only thought on that is the, um, it seems, it, maybe, it, maybe I can uh, make my point by referring to the Benedict option um, idea. It seems like we, we've got uh, uh, so much information, contradictory information, uh, you mentioned the various protocols of COVID. Uh, I suspect everyone knows that there's debate about these things among real scientists. I don't know if everybody does know that. Debate about whether masks actually inhibit the spread of COVID. Um, so who, like, the question, who do you trust? And you have so much information, so many apparent experts that seem to be polar opposites of a question like that. And it does seem like that kind of as connected as we are globally, it seems like we're forced back to kind of local communities of trust. Because uh, the, the only things that we can know for sure, uh, or pretty sure, are things that we know from people that we have uh, genuine, living, embodied, trusting relationships with. So I think that you know, building, building those local communities of trust uh, that doesn't answer the big questions, and we may not be able to answer the big questions of the current situation because so much is contested. Um, you have you have different networks of, obviously different networks of trust. It's not really, it's it's too complicated to say polarization. You have lots of different networks. People trust different people on on all sorts of all sorts of issues, and that you know that that's the uh, the uh, fragmented polity that we live in. But it's, it seems to me that it throws back on kind of Benedict, Benedict community. Uh, local churches, local networks of friends, people that you know, people that you trust, not just because they have expertise, but because you have some confidence in their character. Uh, and then you have some kind of guidance, at least in those kind of local issues, whether or not you can answer the big questions that are contested. You know, Peter, uh, there's a young theologian, evangelical named Alistair Roberts in England, he wrote a really long essay a few years ago online about the crisis of authority. Do you know this essay, Travis? It's, anyway, it, it, he said that we're in a really dangerous situation now where Christians are starting to take these Bible teachers, people like Jen Hatmaker, uh, who have had no theological training at all, but they're taking them as authoritative because they're telling people what they want to hear. And it's not just on the left, like Jen Hatmaker, but all over the place. And this is a really deep crisis because if institutions and those who have had training and who have been ordained to preach the word and all that, if they are no longer trusted and the, the authorities who become trusted are those who have the most Twitter followers or the big, best followers online, we are really in trouble. Well, I, th I think that's all we have time for. Um, I want to thank you, gentlemen. Can, um, can I, can I you say want, real, You want to give some last words? Yeah, I thank yeah, you for it. I want to commend to everybody's attention the man that I, I dedicated my book to, Father Tomislav Kolakovic. Father Kolakovic, I didn't know who this man was until I went to Slovakia to, when I started working on my book. He was a Croatian Jesuit who was living in Zagreb in 1943 doing underground work against the Nazis. When he got a tip that the Gestapo was coming for him, he escaped the country, went to live in Bratislava in nearby Slovakia where his mother was from, adopted her last name, Kolakovic, to hide out. And he began teaching in the local Catholic university. And the thing he began telling his students was, the good news is the Germans are gonna lose this war. The bad news is that when it's over, the communists are going to be ruling this country, and the first people they're going to come after are the Christians. They're going to come after the church, and we've got to get ready for them. So what he did, he brought students together, because these were the people he was working with, 
into small groups for prayer and study, study of the world around them, and for deep uh, discussion about what a Christian, a faithful Christian, is supposed to do about these conditions. Then they would decide on how to act and go out into the world and make this happen. These Kolokovich groups spread quickly all around the country. He called them the family, but every, within two years, every town of any size in Slovakia had one of these groups. The Catholic bishops of Slovakia chastised him and said, Father, you're scaring people. You're being alarmist. It's not going to get as bad as that. But Kolokovich didn't listen because he had studied earlier in his priestly career to be a missionary in Russia. And he knew the, the communist mindset. And sure enough, uh, in 1946, after the Germans lost the war, Kolokovich was kicked out of the country. And in 1948, when there was a communist uh, coup in Czechoslovakia, the first thing they did, they came after the church. The people Father Kolokovich had discipled became the backbone of the underground church. And it was so important, Kolokovich knew this, to educate the laity. Back in those days, the Catholic Church was very clericalist, and they didn't really trust the, the common people to do much. They wanted to keep it in the hands of the clergy. But Kolokovich knew that the Soviets knew this, and that's why they thought that if they decapitated the clergy, they'd be able to kill the church. So Father Kolokovich, working with some sympathetic priests, educated the laity and taught the laity, this is what you have to do when you do not have churches to go to, when you do not have priests. And Father Kolokovich's disciples, most of them went to prison. Father, Dr. Kirchmeri was one of the, the main ones, but they survived prison. When they came out, they began laying the groundwork and they became the only meaningful opposition to communism for 40 years in that country. The church in, the, in that country survived because Father Kolokovich was farsighted and he told them to use the freedom you have to organize and lay these networks down right now. I dedicate the book to him because I believe that in this country, we are in a Kolokovich moment. We don't know when the, the, the curtain is gonna come down. It may not happen like it did in Russia, but the church is slowly, I believe, going to be strangled. We have got to use the freedom that we have right now to uh, build these institutions and networks of believers across denominational lines so we can help each other when people start losing their jobs for being faithful Christians. They've got to be able to know that they can fall, depend on these networks for uh, believers for help. When people start being persecuted, we've got to be able to hide them. This sounds very dramatic, but Solzhenitsyn wrote, wrote in the Gulag Archipelago that in the, if you'd said in the 1890s that within 20, 30 years, there were gonna be tortures brought back to Russia that hadn't been seen since the Middle Ages, nobody would have believed it, and yet it happened. I don't mind being called alarmist because I think there is reason to be alarmed. The people in this country who grew up under communism, they were the ones responsible for my book. They were the ones who were telling me that things were seeing happen in this country now remind us of what we ran away from. And uh, people laugh at them. They get really mad because Americans won't take them seriously. Well, I take them seriously because I listened to them and I went over there to talk to people in the old country, of the old world who survived it. This is not a joke and we have got to get ready. It, don't, do not be intimidated by the idea of being thought weird or alarmist, or that you're an alarmist. You're not. Yeah, a few, few comments to close. Uh, one is, i pick up on the alarmist comment. Um, I think that it, uh, it is alarming to consider how corrupt uh, every major institution of the United States has become. Um, I mean, take your pick. Uh, the media, um, politically biased, the least of it, um, deranged and out of touch with reality in large measure, uh, the universities in large measure. Um, I think there's, uh, there has been some mythology around the deep state over the past four years. I think there is also such a thing as uh, Rod talks about it in the book, a surveillance, a surveillance uh, technology, surveillance state, at least the potential is there. Um, and I think there are definitely politically interested uh, 
uh, members of the uh, federal bureaucracy who want the American, uh, American system, America, to go in one direction or another. Um, I mean, the church uh, in significant sectors is corrupted. I think there's no major institution in the United States that uh, entertainment, um, whatever, you, whatever you pick. So I, I think that that's, um, when you start trying to figure, wh where do you find sanity, sanity as a baseline and then godliness in a major institution of the United States, I think it's very difficult to find. So I think that's exactly right, that we should, uh, we should, we should recognize the, the state of, uh, the, the, the serious condition that we're in. Um, I wanna kind of uh, reiterate something that I, I think Rod alluded to earlier. Um, we talked about martyrdom a bit. Rod developed this a, a good bit. I think it's crucial that we not just prepare ourselves, but the burden is gonna fall on a generation younger than me, and maybe the generation after that. And so we need to be not only preparing ourselves for these costs, but we need to make sure that our children know <coughs> being a Christian in this country at this time means uh, being a witness under duress. And you need to be prepared for that, and you need to be preparing your kids for that to happen. Uh, on the, on the, on the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not just trying to end on a happy note, but um, I do think that that's happening. The kinds of networks that Rod is describing, I think that's happening. I think it's been happening to some degree for a generation, maybe two generations. You think about the number of kids who have been educated at home, in home schools or, or, uh, or in private Christian schools over the last 50 years. Um, not perfect by any means, but there are a lot of faithful young people that have come out of those situations. And uh, there are, there are uh, church networks and other kinds of networks that are developing. And I go back to the point I made at the beginning. Um, Jesus is king, and whatever happens, uh, that, that's not going to change. And he's ruling, and he's shattering the nations with his rod of iron. And if he shatters us, it's part of his work. Uh, we pray that that doesn't happen, but uh, it doesn't threaten his kingship. And that is, uh, very quickly, the difference between hope and optimism for Christians is so important now. And this is a happy note, not a happy note, but a truthful note, and maybe a, <laughs> a hopeful note. Um, optimism is a belief that everything is always going to work out for the best, but that's not actually true. You know, what do you say to, uh, to uh, St. Polycarp? Should he have been an optimist or any of the martyrs? Should they have been optimists? They weren't optimists. They were hopeful. For a Christian, hope is that even if things turn out for the worst, even if the worst happens, even if we lose our lives, if we have done it out of fidelity to Christ, that, the Lord, that we have the sure confidence that the Lord will reward us and use it for the good. So this is why suffering is not something to be sought necessarily, but also not something to be feared if we can suffer as Christians. As Dr. Kirchmeri said, you know, when he was put in his suffering, uh, he said, I'm God's probe. Uh, I tell a story in Live Not By Lies about a, a, Ru a Russian prisoner who was in the gulag and uh, he had, was struggling with his faith. He said, why did God, why did you let this happen to me? You know, and then God sent angels to show him, a, give him a vision that of all the men that he witnessed to who were later executed, but they were going to be in heaven, they were in heaven with the Lord because of that man's faithful witness. He said, ah, that's it, that's what it is. That's us. That's the reason we have to hope. Um, these, uh, th this is a reason to, even if we are persecuted, it is a glorious thing. And uh, we have to start thinking and talking in our families and in our churches and our Christian groups about the value of suffering for Christ. This has helped me in this whole COVID year. I was feeling really sorry for myself about nine months ago about everything that was happening. And I thought, wait a minute, what would Dr. Kirchmeri say? Here I am sitting at home. I don't have, nobody's coming to me to beat me and torture me, but um, I should be God's probe. I should say, what is the Lord trying to teach me and the church in this moment? How can I be more faithful? How can I be of service to the Lord and to my, my family and to the people in my church? And that, that was what brought me out of my slough of despond, you know, is, is thinking about what the martyrs and what the, the confessors of the communist yoke went through and how much easier I had it here, but everybody suffers. Suffering is not something to be 
feared for the Christian. 